He rules everything there is. Now, what's the proof of all that? His miracles. Here are claims to define, to de, uh, define authority. He says, I say unto you, 56 times in the book of Matthew, 12 times in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you've heard, but I say. Who's this I? It's the Son of God. Is he a liar? Did he tell the truth? What would prove it? The miracles. What proves the miracles? They're historically reliable. Authority. Ten times in the book of Matthew, Jesus says, I have the authority. Matthew continues to talk about the authority that Jesus has. And he says, I came to do this. I came not to do that. A claim that he came from God. When I was in Indonesia, uh, John and I were there, I think. John, I remember it was our second trip. I think it was. I was teaching the Gospel of John. And I sat down on the bed in the, in the hotel, and I said, I'm going to read John through. And I scanned it through. Now, I may have missed a couple of times, but I was counting. How many times did John record Jesus saying, I am come down from heaven, John 6.38. My Father hath sent me. I came from heaven. Upwards of 40 times. Just in that one gospel, you begin to commence to start to get the idea. John is trying to communicate to you that Jesus is on a divine mission from God. That is the claim. Over 40 times he claims to have come from God. And we don't know how many times he made the claim in his entire ministry. We just have that in the Gospel of John. So look at all of this and see Christ's claims to have kingdom authority while on earth. Why? In order to prove to them his claim. All right. Now, here are the, he claimed to have a bill and a Well, I just said that, the mission from God. Uh, Christ's reign is manifested in his miracles. Now, a major purpose of the gospel records is to demonstrate who Jesus is. And that's accomplished through his miracles called the works of God, or they're called signs. Now, you're probably familiar with John 20, 30, and 31, where he says many other signs. Now, he could have said works of God, but these are signs. Now, the signs are miraculous, but they don't translate miracle. They translate sign, because these miracles are signs that the claims Jesus made are true. Does that make sense? All right. Many other signs did Jesus in the presence of the disciples, not written in this book of John, but these seven are written that you may believe. You see? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing may have life in his name. So he manifests his sovereign power in the miracles that he works. Now, his reign is manifested in the power to heal disease. I don't need to read that to you. You know about it. The sovereign reign of God is manifested in his power to exercise demons. I want to underline this passage. Matthew 12, 28. Nail it down. Underline it. Circle it. Red, white, and blue. Remember this passage. Jesus has been casting out demons. The Pharisees can't argue with a demonstration. And so they pervert the origin of his power and say, well, he's doing it by the power of the devil. Of course, Jesus put that down. He said, you got the general shooting his own troops, and that won't work. So he makes this statement in verse 28. He says, if I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, and he did, of course, he said, then is the kingdom of God come upon you. Folks, the church hadn't been established yet, but the kingdom was already there. What was there? His sovereign rule. His power was being manifested. Now we have the record of it in historically reliable documents called the New Testament. You see? So we know those things took place and that was done in order that when Pentecost came and Peter would say, this man has been approved unto you by mighty works, wonders, and signs, even as you know. They said, yeah, that's right. We saw him do it. So when Peter said, repent and be baptized, they said, look out, I'm going to be baptized myself. I want in that kingdom. I want under the reign of that marvelous person that loves me. I want to become a member of the church. There's only one. All right? See where we're going? Now, here's the sovereign reign of God manifesting his power to exorcise demons, to forgive sins. Oh, Acts, the second chapter. He's going to forgive sins. Here he is at the right hand of God. And they said, what do we do? 
Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins. 3,000 stepped forward for baptism. I want to know why. Why did 3,000 Jews step forward for baptism? Because they accepted Jesus as the sovereign God. Two chapters later, chapter 4, the number of the men in the church become 5,000. So many a commentator has estimated there's anywhere from 12 to 15,000 Christians by Acts, the fourth chapter. You see, people watched him walk on the water, change water to wine, heal the sick, raise the dead, manifest the power, confirm his claim. So then, he came to destroy Jerusalem. I want you to look at Mark 14, verse 61 and 62. Now the same thing is in Matthew chapter 27. In this passage, he's on trial. And it's stated here in verse 61. 60, verse 60. The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him, Art thou the Christ? the Son of the Blessed. And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. How'd they see him do that? How'd they see him sitting and coming at the same time? Sitting and coming. This was in the destruction of Jerusalem when his servant, Titus Vespasian, that pagan general, came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem according to his own prophecy. Now if we understand this, Jesus said he would destroy it. Now turn to Matthew 24. And folks, if you read Matthew 24, 1 through 13, verse 14 will be clear. Now in Matthew 24, he's not talking about the end of the world. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. In Matthew 24, 1 and 2, the disciples come to Jesus and talk about those magnificent stones that have been quarried out upon, uh, by which the temple of Herod was built. It was a magnificent structure. And they came, and Jesus said, not one of these stones is going to be left one on top of the other. He, so he talked about the destruction of the temple. And verse 3, his disciples come and ask him, when? There's a time element, shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the inos, not the cosmos, not the end of the world, but the end of the age, the consummation of the age, not the end of time. He isn't talking about the second coming as we do, the end of time. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he says in verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom, stop. What's kingdom? What kingdom? The kingdom, he says, it's, he says it's, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom's at hand, and I, if I cast out demons by the power of God, then is the kingdom, the reign of God, come upon you, and the good news of this reign that I have for your salvation will be preached among all the nations then till the end. Now that gospel has already been preached among all the nations. Read Colossians 1.23 where Paul said the gospel has been preached in every creature under heaven. Case closed. Now don't let somebody tell you well, now Jesus can't come right now because the gospel isn't over here. It's not over there. It hadn't been preached over there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Colossians 1.13 has already been preached in all the world. Now Jesus is going to all the world preach the gospel and Paul says it's been done and Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70 by Titus Vespasian. And when he did, they saw the sign of Christ's power. What was it? He predicted the destruction of Jerusalem. Luke chapter 21 and 2 talked about how the Roman armies would encircle the city, and it happened just exactly like he prophesied it. Now, all that was preached by the apostles and by Christians in the first century before the destruction of the temple came. It was all that power. Jesus is God. Jesus is the reigning one. He's the fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7. He's the seed of David. 
Now all that's been preached, and then Jerusalem was destroyed like he prophesied, and in the destruction of Jerusalem was the confirmation of Jesus' prophetic truth. He's the great prophet. He's the Son of God. And the destruction of Jerusalem was but one miracle among many that people saw happen and confirmed his claim. Okay? Now, he controls all of society and circumstances. They tried to throw, <laughs> I love this one in Luke 4, they, he went into the temple and he quoted from Isaiah, one of the great servant prophecies, uh, servant passages. And he said, This day hath this prophecy been fulfilled in your ears. And they beheld the grace that came out of his mouth. And they took issue with him. And they hated him. And they took him by force and wanted to take him to the, uh, to the precipice of a mountain there in Nazareth. Has anybody taken a trip over there to that part? You seen that area, that, that precipice? Boy, you fall off, you break your ankle or your neck. And they were going to throw him off. And what does the passage say at the end of this statement in Luke? It says, he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. He said, excuse me, I need to leave. I've got an appointment somewhere else. Somebody said, where is he? Bring him up here now. Somebody says, you had him last. No, you did. No, you had him. Where is he? I don't know. Somebody says, there he goes. How did he get through all those people? Think about an old Texas horse thief back in about the 1800s. And here's a, huh? Get a rope. Yeah. They got this fella. They got a rope. They put him on the horse, put the rope around his neck. What does he say? I got to leave. Bye. You think he could do it? He couldn't do it, but Jesus did. Who's controlling society? Who's overruling in everything? They tried to arrest him. They couldn't do it. His hour hadn't come. There's a destiny that Jesus came to fulfill at a particular time. Jesus says, I'm going to die by crucifixion. They tried to stone him. Didn't work. They tried to throw him off a cliff. Couldn't do it. They tried to arrest him. Couldn't do it. Why not? His time hadn't come. In other words, there was a particular time in which he would die a particular way on the cross, not some other way. All that's fulfilled. Now, who's controlling society? Jesus did while he was here. Read your Bible. It's fascinating. All right. So before Pilate, he said, if this power is not given you from above, you would have no power over me. That's what he told Pontius Pilate. He controlled the timing of his death. I just talked to you about that. He manifested his power over natural law. In John, the second chapter, he changed water to wine. Now, out in West Texas, we have a winery. I understand. They tell me it's advertising. This is not by taste test, you understand. That the wine that we put out over there even uh, excels, I've heard, the wine uh, in, in France. Well, that's quite a, an accomplishment. How long does it take West Texans to make that wine? I really don't know, but they tell me it takes a long time. Now, whether that means years or decades, I don't know. But Jesus changed water to wine like that. Pretty good trick if you can do it. In other words, he had power over what? Natural law. It didn't hinder him. Look at the fourth chapter. In this fourth chapter, you have a man who is a nobleman. His boy is sick. He's in Capernaum. Jesus was in Canaan. He heard that Jesus, who had changed water to wine, was in Canaan. He came to get him. Jesus said, go home, your son lives. He went back and he asked his servants, says, how's my boy? And they said, he's alive, he's okay, he's well. He said, when did that happen? And I guess they looked at the ancient equivalent of a modern Elgin and said, well, he's fine. What time, Jesus, uh, uh, he asked them, did my boy begin to heal? And they said, about this time yesterday. He says, that's the very time in which Jesus said to me, thy son liveth. And the scripture says he believed on him. Well, I guess so. He healed him 20 miles away. Now, if Jesus can heal a man 20 miles away, can he heal him 21 miles away? Well, if he heals a man 21 miles, can he heal 22 miles away? Shall I go on? You get the point? These are historical facts. These are not fictions. All right? And so, in John the 5th chapter, here's a man lame in his legs. Jesus says, take it to your bed and walk. And he does. In the 6th chapter, you have two miracles. In the 24-hour period, Jesus feeds 5,000 with a couple of fish and 